my skis on, I'll be a happy guy, so whatever that amounts to be. My first ski instructor was an Austrian. His name was Willy Angra, but he never taught me to yodel like our previous speaker, so I promise I won't do that. I'm going to talk about a phenomenon that exists today in North American ski resorts, and that is uh, a situation that has come about, and we're sitting on a huge opportunity, and it's what I call the re-socialization of the North American ski experience. Where do I point this thing? Oh, here we go. So, what has happened really over the last, between about 1985 and 2000, there were villages built all over North America. Resort villages, this one in Tromla, and I was intimately involved in this, but it's a, it's a represents a big opportunity in that in nearly all these resorts, these villages sit, they're full 60 days a year, and the rest of the days of the winter, they run at very low occupancies. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> and why is that? So there's hundreds and thousands of empty beds. And those hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of empty beds are just sitting there. And here's one of the, here's one of the interesting things about this phenomenon, is that in, in the business, all these beds were built with other people's money. And so in other words, the ski industry never assumed a big debt on this. These are owned by other people who are actually real converts and fans of the ski resorts that they bought these condominiums in. And what this big splurge in real estate uh, sales uh, allowed was reinvestment in fabulous list lift installations, restaurants, uh, villages, and creating experiences that had been, I guess, a little spartan in previous years. So my goal today is to talk about, let's capitalize on what we already have. We have this huge bed base that's sitting empty. Now, what are the things we can do about it? And I think, here's another interesting point. There are lots of partners who are interested in investing in, in sponsoring events and creating special opportunities for them to exhibit their products, whether it be uh, the, the automobile industry, computer industry, there's lots of people out there who are looking to channel their products into many of the, the, this particular demographic that I think represents a big opportunity for us. So I'm going to begin by talking about what was the experience like. And these are two very famous Canadians and critical people in the formation of the ski business. So Jack Rabbit Johansson on the left, who lived to be well over 100 and cut many of the ski trails in the Laurentians, which is sort of the birthplace of skiing in, in Canada. And then Rael Charette, who ran the ski school in Grey Rocks, which was sort of the, the, the center where ski, ski schools and that whole training and the education of skiers and ski instructors began. So, in addition to that, we had ski clubs and ski trains, and a hut experience, and in, in many cases, it was very social. And it was social in that uh, the, the, the cooking duties, um, the cleaning of the huts, was uh, communal eating, and many of those places started out very small. But it created lifetime memories. And this is a great old picture of kids eating with kids. And they made lifetime friends and just had a great time. And if you talk to many skiers who are now my age, they look back and say, well, yeah, it was great then, but it's not like that now. Adults with adults, people were meeting people. It was a very social experience. And lifetime friendships, friendships were created. And it, it was really a, a very social time. And it was also the growth of the ski school. The ski school were the absolute heroes in the day. And they had extraordinary skill sets. Very charismatic ski school directors. And, you know, the, we had through, certainly through New Zealand and through um, Canada as well, Austrian, Swiss, French, people like Stein Erickson, and then 
you know, Canada started to grow its own ski school directors. People like Jim McConkey, Ernie McCullough, we had Hannah Schneider also made tours through the United States and Canada. And back then, there were ski weeks. People would come in Sunday night and leave Friday night. So the weekend sort of looked after itself, but the midweek was an animated week with uh, ski instructors hosting, giving demonstrations, creating the race of the week. People got medals they could take home and hang in their office. And we had a lot more ceremony and celebration about what we were doing in terms of bringing people to our resorts, teaching them how to ski, and just ensuring more than anything else they were having a great time. Of course, the difference between, in skill levels between ski professionals and those who were not pros was just enormous. There were very few people who could do any of these things in those days. And the focus was really on the guest experience social events, the welcome cocktail, and I guess my point would be here is that in very few resorts, the ski company, the lift company, looks after everything between eight and four. And once you get to four o'clock, who owns the guest experience at that point? And today, I would tell you that in most North American resorts, the guest experience at four o'clock just falls flat on his face. So, in this era, it was very fashionable and it gained extraordinary media coverage. And this is um, Life magazine from 1945. And this picture is shot on top of Trombla. Nice day, minus 40. But, but to think that uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's difficult for us to get the kind of coverage that skiing got in the mid, late 40s, early 50s. It, it was very elegant, very fashionable, and uh, the skiing, the clothing, the lifestyle, the mountain experience, and the whole concept of exploring winter, doing something new and exciting. Now, we're in, there's a whole bunch of different magazines today, and our distribution or coverage in those magazines is but it's very narrow in terms of who actually are skiers. So I'm going to talk just briefly about what I would call the industrialization of the North American ski experience. So these two guys in 19 uh, mid 80s went to uh, Wall Street, but so did the ski industry. And you had the creation of companies as public companies like American Ski Company, Interwest, Vail Resorts, Booth Creek, and the business really changed. And then at the same time, there was a, a growing baby boomer population that had financial capabilities, and it created a demand for hundreds of thousands of new beds. And these are all the villages I'm talking about that were built through, essentially from the middle of 19, well, 85, through until about 2000. <clears throat> and something else happened, and I've sat on both sides, I haven't sat on the ski school side of this, but the ski schools, many of which were private at the time, were acquired by these companies. And it, to some degree, it was the corporate takeover, and particularly these companies that I talk about on the top, uh, there was more focus on dollars, was it less focused on guest? Maybe not, but certainly the ski school director became uh, under a lot of pressure to deliver at the bottom line. And I think there was more pressure on business and less emphasis on passion. And profits were measured daily, and they still are, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and I think there's not a ski school director that doesn't know what his, what his daily, weekly, monthly budget is. So, essentially, the publicly traded companies, ski schools became swept up in that whole drive forward to, you know, can we drive the share price? And increasing the bottom line on an annual basis by, you know, we're going to have to move it by 5% or 10% or whatever that number was in each, each, each company. And then benchmarking across resorts. So what does X resort do in terms of revenue per visit? And what are they, what's their cost structure and what's, what sort of margin is that ski school producing? And so to some degree, we had a, 
a forcing of two things. Best practices in terms of how we manage kids and the growth of this kids' ski school, what those facilities like. But at the same time, there was downward pressure on cost. And any time you put downward pressure on cost, there's always a balance point of, you know, what's the quality, what's the cost? And then, you know, if you can deliver both quality, service, what's the price? So, even though we measured guest satisfaction daily, I think there was a, there was a change in the product that we, we delivered. But at the, hang on. At the same time, we, the publicly traded companies, had access to huge amounts of investment capital. And so we were able to build lifts. There was a huge change. We got into detachables, and we had to attach high-speed lifts everywhere. Snowmaking, we got into very high-quality snowmaking. And grooming, we could groom almost anything. And we got into terrain parks and everything else. So, whether we had big snow, no snow, whether it came early or late, we could pretty much fix it because we had access to money. Now, if it was warm, we still haven't figured, really figured that out. But um, we have a very good snow surface every day, and that's been a revolution, I think. The other thing is, you know, what's happened in lifts, and this is lift and verbier, there's nothing like that in North America yet. Or oh, maybe uh, there's a chandel, I think, somewhere. But just the ease of use, how easy it is to get on and off these things, it made it so easy for us to move a lot of people up on the mountain. But these things were expensive. So I think even though I've got this flashy picture on the left, I think the most powerful thing that has been developed in terms of growing our sport, growing our industry, is a magic carpet because it's so easy to learn on. So in most of these resorts where all these huge bed, huge bed bases have been built, they're still running 80%, but only for about 60 days. And you could say, well, you're, you're serious, and I, I'll tell you, you can add up the numbers, but figure it's 10 days, maybe two weeks at Christmas. Then you've got weekends, there's 20 of them. And by the time you throw in school break and maybe one or other two long weekends, you're around about 60 days. Maybe some years you're up 70, but call it somewhere between 60 plus. But it certainly isn't 140. This is a picture I took in France last year, but look at the capacity of this lift. You know, it's probably, it's a six-pack, it's probably 3,600 people per hour, and there's nobody there. And so, I could have taken this picture in any resort in North America on a Tuesday in January, and a lot of them look the same. So, our capacity utilization, I think, is embarrassing. You know, we're running at full tilt 60 days out of 130, call it 140, 150-day season, out of 360 days a year. So it represents a huge opportunity. How do we fill this? So <clears throat> if you think about it, our capital cost and our operating structures are built around a 60-day season. And then we saw something else happen just in the last couple of years, the ski week, which I would argue we need to find a way to reinvent and, and repackage. But where it all started collapsed under the pressure of who knows what, a whole variety of things, competition, but Grey Rocks eventually closed. So I would propose that there's a couple of issues. And here's one that has fascinated me for some time, is what's the difference between what the experience used to be and what it is now? Certainly we're doing way more skier visits as the United States is going to do, you know, he'll probably crack 60 million visits this year, be a record again. But people used to come, they used to stay in a ho what looked like a hotel room. And it might have had a TV in it, but there wasn't a whole lot of room. There certainly were not any cooking facilities. 
And this is what was built in all these villages, the picture on the right. And you've got your hot tub and your, you know, two bathrooms and TV and a kitchen and uh, you name it. They've got it all. And so what's happening is whereas the people who were staying in the hotel had to get out of there and go walk around and meet people and talk to people, we've got, we've replicated exactly what fa the family left at home in these condos. Yeah, then your room was where you slept. Now you cook, eat, light the fire, watch TV, text, web surf, video games, all that stuff you did at home. You leave essentially only to ski and buy groceries. Maybe that's a little extreme, but you get the picture. So basically, and somebody who has kids and travels, has kids who race and travels from resort to resort, said to me, well, yeah, it's, you know, for mom, she just traded kitchens. So is she really on holiday? And the old man's watching a football game, a hockey game, something like that. <laughs> and the kids are probably playing a video game. But essentially, we have completely replicated the experience that people were trying to take a holiday from. Because we've given them all the ability to do those things. I think this is one thing that we should look at from a ski school standpoint. I have a son now who's 16, so he's dragging me out of bed to go ski the powder early in the morning. But back when he was, you know, when kids are little, they have a problem waking up. And, uh, but we, we make our kids, you know, ski school opens at 8.30, kids got to be there by 9, blah, blah, blah. And to some degree, is there a better way for us to do that? Should we be picking kids up in the condo building? Is there some way that we can make that? Can we put the family on holiday somehow in terms of how we integrate those kids, bring them in and teach them? We certainly have better facilities than we've ever had for kids. <clears throat> but I think this is my major issue, is they leave after four to six days and they really haven't made any new friends because we've designed the socialization out of the villages. They're not eating with other kids. They're, they're really in their own little world that they've moved from home to the condo. And so that whole concept of, you know, same time next year, well, who do they know that they would come back to meet? And I think that's something we really need to begin to focus on, is how do we make friends, have those kids make friends, and uh, move into the kind of thing that happened earlier when kids ate with kids and teenagers ate with teenagers and adults ate, ate with adults. What I would say is I see... <laughs> There's glimmers of hope, and this is a display that's, that happens in Whistler, it's called a Fire and Ice Show, and it's pretty neat. And it brings everybody together out on a Sunday night, so it's sort of the kickoff of the ski week. But there's also some very good things happening in Whistler, for example, during, and it's simple stuff, during Christmas and New Year's, teenage dance in the conference center. And in one of the other conference rooms, it was kids... Uh, a play for smaller kids and things for to, to do for kids because so much of the village experience is designed around spending money. Bars, restaurants, and alcohol plays a very big part. And we, if we can get that away from the younger kids, you know, my 16-year-old son, if he meets a girl, they'll be texting for the rest of their life. Facebook, all that other stuff. All those engines to drive return visits are in place. We just have to make that first connection. So, so much of the coming back to the resort, so much of the cost is fixed. The beds are empty. The lifts, I say, are empty. That's a stretch. But if you thought about your revenue picture, if you thought about your cost structures, it's not really fixed. You flex it down to some degree. But fundamentally, once you get it down to a level, you can't get it any lower. Your office is running, your ticket window's open, lifts are running, you're maintaining them, you're running the cats to do the grooming. 
so you've got a fixed line there. So if you can put another dollar in the top, it goes as a contribution against your fixed cost. And actually, if you stand back and look at it, you can pretty much say that dollar is going to flow through to the bottom line. So it's a motivation that I think is quite considerable to look and see can we, what can we do. So here's something that fascinates me, and I think we really need to work on this. But some of the most powerful drivers in North American ski resorts during off-peak are Gay Ski Week, followed by the World Ski and Snowboard Festival in Whistler. You know that the World Ski and Snowboard Festival in Whistler does more skier visits than the whole state of Colorado in that week. So there's a message there. It's more about programming. Figure out your target. Put the programming together. Is it music? Is it activities? What are those things? Special interest groups? And then get that out there and see if we can bring those specific groups, groups to visit. But I, my question is, you know, really, is that the best we can do? And I would tell you, we can do a lot better. We need to challenge our marketing folks. But the ski school also has a role here. I think a very big role. And we need to sort of, I think there's lessons as we turn around and look back and say, what did the ski school do then? What can we do with the ski school today? And I come back to the same thing. At 4 o'clock, who owns the guest experience? And in most North American resorts, everybody would look at you and go, well, we're done. We turned the key off. It's over. So I guess it's the restaurant's job. Well, no. The, restaurant, the guy running the restaurant, he, he doesn't perceive his role is to animate. And so this is a big gap. So if you go back to the days of Tromla when, and Grey Rocks when the ski school had dinner with the guests maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, there was the race, they handed out the medallions. Ski school to some degree was like the GO that you have in Club Med. You know, it's maybe a little bit of a, a stretch, but I think you get the picture. But what we had were consummate professionals who had great personalities and kind of glued the experiential pieces together and thought about, and we had it programmed and built into, the, into our guest experience that those things happened two nights a week. But as the corporate influence grew, what the ski pro had done to grow the business, to create those relationships, same time next year, Hey, Johnny, maybe next year you'll get a bronze. All those things, I think some of that was lost. There's a lot of that still there, but I think we need to look back and think about how do we get to where we are and, and how can we bring some of that back. <clears throat> you know, we have amazing equipment. Um, it's fast, it's user-friendly. I would, I would tell you that if I was in the Austrian ski business, I would be looking at how you guys do a better job of dealing with kids. Most of the gondolas and buses, I think, it, 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 they wouldn't have this kind of experience. But I think our, our motivation as ski area operators is that we have a huge capital cost, and it's running flat out 60 days a year. So I come back to every incremental dollar against fixed cost. There's a flow through component of that. So what are the things that we can do? Well, it, I don't know about the demographics in the rest of the world, but in North America, I can tell you that Gen Y, the oldest Gen Ys now, like I, uh, the oldest Gen Ys are now 35. So that's a big group. And what's interesting is they have more flex time than either the baby boomers or, or Generation X. They also have a lot of disposable income. And so 
Can we get them to come to resorts? And what, what I've seen is that they respond more to programming than they do to price. We think they're price sensitive, but if you have the right music or the right activities or the right event, that they will respond to that better than they will if you just drop the price in half. And so there's some real effort needs to be made there. Is that mu music's very powerful. I said all that stuff. So, what, other thing, what else can we do in terms of programming for re-socialization? How do we begin to create an experience that will... Because these beds are sitting empty. And we don't, we're not carrying any debt on them. It's the owner of the condo who carries the debt. But some of this stuff goes on in ski areas, I'm told. Um, but there is, you know, if you think about in North America, those of you who live there, what the Florida Beach business has done for spring break. And so the beach business, whether it be in you know, Florida or Gulf Coast, has created this whole image around spring break. That's where people go. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to create events around spring break. Because these kids have money. And they can sure get a group going faster than we ever knew how. So it's a matter of how do we germinate the water and get it going. Maybe that's not the best use of phrase, but <clears throat> I think you know, I come back to it. The technology, the boots, the skis, the rental equipment, the lift equipment. Um, and I think that the ski school people have, a, have extraordinary interpersonal skills. In fact, they have the best interpersonal skills in our business. And they have the contact and the ability to help generate and animate some of that activity. If you look, look at programming, and this is, is, we're seeing these groups respond more to programming than you do to price. So I come back to is events, what's the programming? If it's just price, then you're really in the wrong end of your business. So if you look at the Whistler, the Whistler Olympic experience, I mean, clearly, it was the Olympics, so you had this amazing thing that happened. But in the village, every night, there was music. There was a whole variety of events that happened in different plazas. There was three or four different plazas running all the time, and it was extraordinary. And there was just this sensation that you were in something special. Now, I don't think you can replicate that every night. That's clearly something's tied to the Olympics, and this part of the Olympic energy comes out and drives that. But our villages are pretty static places for a big piece of the year. And if you thought about, do you want to bring these groups here, what are the things that they want to do? <clears throat> this is a detail. I think, you know, the lifts, we're running shorter ride times. We're carrying more people, but there's less conversation. You know, <laughs> there's got to be something we can do about that. Um, so, in any event, that's sort of, in a nutshell, what I think the issues are, some of the ideas of what we could do, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Please give me a hand in thanking him. Well, that's bringing the end of, uh, end of this day pretty much to a close. A couple of reminders. The Interski Mile is still going on, so don't forget to visit that. The Interski Quiz is still going on. I understand this morning Poland has a slight lead, so there's still a chance to catch them on that. So be sure if you haven't partaken, please do. Thanks for your attention this evening or this afternoon, rather. Please enjoy your evening, and we'll see you uh, bright in the morning. Have a great night. Bye-bye.